Londinium Britannia, 3rd century CE. You descend into darkness. Around you, flickering shadows dance in low lantern flames as you see Roman worshippers breaking bread in a ritual meal. Among them are politicians, soldiers, even slaves, all acting as equals. For a moment, you think this might be a Christian chapel, built underground to elude authorities. But once your eye catches the statue at the end, glowing in a shaft of light, you realize there's nothing Christian about it. It is a white bull surrounded by animals. A dog laps at its spilling blood, while a snake coils around one leg, mouth open to the ruby droplets. A raven looks on as a scorpion viciously clamps on the bull's scrotum, and astride the animal sits the god Mithras, wrenching the bull's head up and plunging a dagger into its neck. What does this mean? Well that, dear viewer, is a secret. Unless, of course, you'd like to join the Brotherhood. so much to Factor for being the secret that keeps us extra historians well-fed fast. Ah, uh, dear viewer, I can see you are a curious sort. A subscriber, hopefully, of a certain quality. Well, if you wish for illumination, all you have to do is follow me. I'd be lying if I said we weren't watching you for some time, noting your hunger for the truth. And truth is something we can most assuredly give. That is, of course, if you dare take it. Oh, Ali, the blindfold, please. Welcome, seeker of knowledge, to Ordo Extra Historia! A clandestine society dedicated to forbidden knowledge of the past and terrible Latin. Over the next several weeks, as you move up in our ranks, we will grant you revelations about some of history's most famous secret societies, why they formed, what members got out of them, and how they influenced history. Now, our order has long lurked in the shadows, with many famous and prominent members throughout time, like, well, you know, Ali over there, and Zoe, uh, me, of course, Rob, definitely, founding member, uh, and, you know, George, George Washington was probably one, too. You can't prove he wasn't, because, ah, <laughs> secrets. But before we get into any of that, we must first tell you the secret rules of our order you must follow. Supreme Excellent Lawgiver, if you please. Bam! Right there! You break that covenant, and we will be so mad at you. But enough preamble! On to the first grade of revelations that we bequeath upon you. The history of one of the oldest secret societies, the Cult of Mithras. Mithraism was a mystery religion, a specific subset of religious beliefs that thrived in the ancient world, and as you will find out each episode as you move up in our ranks, would eventually come to define later secret societies. Mystery religions were small subsets of Greek and Roman religious worshippers who practiced secret rites, claiming special or ancient knowledge of mythic figures, religious stories, or esoteric subjects. Pythagoreans, for example, held the secrets of geometry and told tales of its place in the cosmic order. The cult of Isis was a Hellenistic group born during the melding of Greek and Egyptian religion, which claimed special understanding of magic. And during Dionysian rituals, the god of wine and fruitfulness presided over heavy drinking and sexual rites. Granted, there were many, many more, all sharing similar rules. Secret rituals and knowledge, selective invite-only membership, and hierarchical grades where one gained more knowledge, power, or insight, the higher one rose. These societies themselves weren't secret. Their inner workings, however, were. But among the most successful cults were the Mithraic Mysteries. Though, first, we do need to go over the true meaning of that word, cult. See, the modern world has given the word cult a bit of a bad rap, because you hear cult, and you're likely to picture Heaven's Gate, or the Branch Davidians, or maybe an English rocker telling you that some woman's selling sanctuary, but that last one might just be me. But what cult actually means academically is a subset of worship, basically a group within a group with slightly divergent beliefs, like the cult of the Virgin Mary in Catholicism, for example. However, in the 20th century, the word increasingly became used as a pejorative to describe new religious movements that traditional religions considered threatening or uncomfortable. But just know that when we use it here, it's academically. What we know for sure about Mithraism is actually fairly scant, because its members held their vow of secrecy well. Ancient texts discussing the group are frequently either asides or from people such as early Christians criticizing it. 
But when some of these accounts are cross-referenced with the remains of Mithras temples, known as Mithraeums, found all over the Roman world, some information can be corroborated. We know, for instance, that like many mystery religions, Mithraism involved a select group of worshippers sharing a communal meal. And we know these communities were small due to the size of the buildings, which were often either built in or built to resemble a cave. Likely, no more than 20 to 30 men, the Mithraic Mysteries being a male-only group, could fit in there at the same time. However, archaeological evidence does suggest that the wider community would occasionally feast outside in a community event. We also know from carvings that the seven grades of membership described in the written accounts were definitely used. These ranged from the lowest-ranked Korax or Raven first-rank members, to the fourth-ranked Leo or Lion, all the way to the seventh-ranked Pater or Fathers, who served as leaders. Generally, it's assumed that most adherents would achieve the Leo ranking. Now, no one's really sure exactly how these ranks worked, since some evidence suggests they were disregarded during the meals, or not particularly hierarchical. But it is known that each elevation in grade did come with a series of ordeals, which could involve endurance of temperature extremes, or being blindfolded and threatened with death. One body-sized pit discovered in a Mithraeum in northern England suggests some sort of simulated or symbolic burial and rebirth. In another, the initiate had to refuse all crowns, saying their only crown was Mithras. Now, if you've noticed an astrological theme at this point, you are not imagining things. Most of these ranks and symbolic animals had astrological significance. Each grade was tied to one of the seven known planets of the classical world, and it's generally assumed Mithras himself contained some astronomical significance, though that itself is buried in mystery. Actually, speaking of mysteries, you're probably also wondering who exactly this Mithras was. Like, what was he the god of? Well, that's surprisingly a difficult question as well. The Romans certainly thought he was Persian, since he wears a Persian-style cap. And Mithras seems to be related to an earlier Persian god, Mithra, who presided over contracts and agreements. However, the cult itself is so traditionally Roman that it's believed only a few key details, and possibly just the name, of the god were borrowed. In other words, he's not an ancient Persian god. He's the Roman idea of an ancient Persian god. The Roman Mithras appears to have been a form of solar deity, who hunted a cosmic bull and dragged it to an underground cave before slaughtering it. Though, rather than an act of destruction, this may have been a story of creating bounty, since the bull's wound often incorporates sprouting grain stalks. But again, these are theories and not well understood. Mithras was also associated heavily with the Roman sun god Sol Invictus, who features in art from Mithraeums. What is clear, though, is that Mithras was popular. Archaeologists have identified between 200 and 400 possible Mithraeums throughout the former Roman Empire, with the cult beginning in the 1st century CE and continuing into the 4th century. In fact, so many Mithraeums have been discovered, some with membership lists on their walls, that it's actually possible to track members transferring from one group to another, which seems to have been a major appeal of the sect. See, Mithraism was a cult that attracted the common people, middle class, and even slaves. But it was also vastly popular in the Roman army, which was a group that frequently moved around. Mithraeums have been discovered at the very edges of the Roman Empire, from military outposts in Syria to one literally built under Hadrian's Wall. For a soldier being transferred to a new posting, the local Mithraeum could be a touchstone that gave them both a familiar environment and inbuilt group of companions. Its masculine themes of hunting and violence no doubt appealed to soldiers who would have also used the social atmosphere to form connections that might aid their careers. Because there, commanding officers could be approached as brothers rather than superiors, and a high grade in the group signaled trustworthiness and status. This tie with the army likely became increasingly close during the later Roman Empire, as the Emperor Aurelian established the cult of Sol Invictus, popular with troops, and a major feature in Mithras worship alongside traditional Roman religion. However, by the 4th century, Mithras had a powerful foe in early Christianity. The belief systems competed for converts, but really it was no contest. The enclosed and intimate nature of Mithraism meant it couldn't propagate with the speed and missionary zeal of Christianity. Though, arguably, the priesthood would eventually take many of the aspects of mystery religions, such as elaborate incantations, hierarchical grades of membership, and special knowledge. But then, over a thousand years later, when the Catholic Church had a hold on political power, another secret society emerged to challenge it. The Illuminati.
But, dear viewer, those secrets are for when you return next time and attain your second grade of wisdom in the Ordo Extra Historia. But, you know, there is one last secret I can bequeath to you before we part ways until next time. And that is the code to unlock affordable breakfast, lunch, and dinner enlightenment with Factor! <clears throat> Seriously, though, there's a discount code at the end of the read. Factor, of course, being my favorite ready-to-eat meal delivery service that I've been using for over a year and a half now. Because each of their tasty meals is ready in just two minutes with no prep, no mess, and best of all, no cleanup. Just great food ready when I have time to eat it. It seriously removes so much stress from my day, it is awesome. Each week, I review Factor's rotating menu and pick what I'm feeling from their tons of seasonal meals and add-on options. Like their cold-pressed juices, protein shakes, wellness shots, and smoothies that I know, you know, I can't get enough of. There's so many options to choose from, I can always be sure that every in my household is going to get the food that they love fast. And since spring has officially sprung, I was craving their tomato basil chicken risotto. And let me tell you, it did not disappoint. Plus, since I didn't have to cook a whole meal from scratch, I was actually able to take the pets out in this gorgeous weather for extra walks. No, that's not the name of a new show of ours. Although, mm, I digress. So head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use the code extra credit 50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next box. Okay, got it? Good. Now it's tasty task time. Get fast and flavorful meals at a deep discount here, and once your dinner is decided, check out our next savory selection here. Say, did you hear the one about Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Izzy Coin, Ilkner, Dominic Valenciana, Arclight Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being legendary patrons? Yeah, turns out they're the best. 